It's five o'clock. I'd like to call this meeting of the select board to order on August 5th. First item is additions and deletions to the agenda. I'd just like to add um, the approval of an interim um, administrative officer. Anything else? Distance comments? Um, hold on one second. Make sure no one. Nothing online that I see. Okay. We can go right into the. So do you want to do the quick um, administrative officer? Yeah, sure. Sure. Um, so as you know, Stephen Bauer has left um, the municipality. Uh, as planning and zoning director, he was also elected to be administrative officer. Uh, the town needs someone to administer the bylaws and his absence until we have someone on full Good full time. Uh, mm -hmm. The planning <coughs> commission um, recently uh, voted to um, make Stephanie Applefellow the interim um, administrative officer. So I asked the select board um, approve that as well. And so she have the power to enforce the bylaws in his absence. Is there a motion? I'll make the motion to approve Stephanie Applefeller as administrative officer. Is there a second? Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. Next is. Next. So, Craig Jude here from MSK Engineering. Um, he is the one who did the uh, engineering study for uh, the Woodstock Aqueduct Company last year. Uh, we've been using him as a kind of consultant to go through the process of the town looking to acquire the water system. Uh, so we asked him here tonight to kind of ask, ask some questions on what capital projects he would recommend and kind of the overall status of the aqueduct system itself. Okay, if you don't mind, hand of the podium, uh, and then we can kind of open it up for questions uh, from the board and then maybe the residents as well after that. The town is muted. Oh, sorry. Why is that happening? No impression. Right. Did I do it? Is everyone we're all green? Yeah. Okay, Carrie, can you hear us? Yes. Okay. Okay. Sorry about that. Um, so I was hired uh, by the aqueduct to develop a preliminary engineering study uh, related to the water system. Uh, mainly to identify and address um, potential improvements that could be made to upgrade the water system and the hydraulic deficiencies during certain fire flow events. Um, the, the engineering study took a look at the uh, water system as a whole and came up with um, several alternatives to consider and the proposed alternative slash project to come out of that was uh, transmission improvements from Cox District Road, where the current water storage tank uh, is, to uh, along Route 4 uh, to the bridge, and to also consider and identify a um, new water storage tank uh, site, and if uh, land could be acquired, uh, design, permit, and construct a second tank um, on the water system. Those two alternatives together um, address the deficiency concern uh, that the state had. Um, the engineering study did not look at the water system as a whole to look at uh, longer range capital improvement projects that could be considered or should be considered, um, but I certainly have reviewed enough of the system to be able to talk about that um, in some preliminary detail. Um, if there are questions related to capital improvements beyond uh, the projects identified in the preliminary engineering study. Um, if I could, could you kind of describe um, what the cost would be to get the water flow up to an adequate place? And also, are those projects just to get us above the state regulations, or is that enough to also have new connections at the same time? Um, I don't remember the exact number in the report. And I apologize for not having that in front of me. I believe it was in the neighborhood of uh, $10 million um, to do the transmission line improvements and to um, build a new storage tank. 
Um, there were some assumptions with the storage tank, seeing how none of the land is owned by the town um, or the aqueduct. Um, so there would be some sort of negotiation and third party cooperation that would be necessary for any of the tank sites involved. Um, that was the first part of your, oh, the second part of your question was that would bring the deficiencies up to current standards that would allow for future connections. Um, it would allow for other projects to be developed that require fire flow, um, uh, fire suppression systems or fire flow uh, in front of their properties. Um, it, it would allow that it would not address the older water mains that are still in the ground uh, from the original construction of the aqueduct company. Are you looking for my number? Yeah, I'm looking at turn it. I, I can I can confirm it. Yeah, this, this, this is a nine year average width, but yep, we had a project cost of uh, just under nine point two million dollars. What page are you on? Uh, this is page forty one of the report. It's in table forty, and that assumes alternative one B and two. One B being the transmission main, and two being the water storage tank replacement. So that's on page 41 of the report. Table 40, it's actually listed as the effect of annual user rates, effect on annu annual user rates. The project cost is listed there. It's provided in some further detail uh, in previous sections of the report, but it's just under 9.2 for both uh, improvements uh, identified. And do both of these projects need to get done to get to the adequate position we need to be, or could one of them? So alternative 1B will address the majority of the issues, but it will not bring all hydrants up to compliance. It's a, it's a matter of how many fire hydrants would be quote unquote deficient from the state standpoint. Um, 1B would address the majority of the concerns and there are alternatives to address the remaining fire hydrants that are not up to standard. Um, and, and ways to mitigate that. So I don't wanna say that they have to be done to that satisfaction. Doing both of those projects will bring all fire hydrants up to current standards. And it should be noted that the condition that we're talking about um, has been um, the same way since the last storage tank was built. So this has been a deficiency that the town or that the aqueduct has been under for quite a while and the town and uh, village have found a way to do fire suppression. So I just want to be clear that there's the, the rule and the regulation related to standards versus um, ways to get around some of the uh, hydraulic deficiencies of the system currently. And what are some, what would be some of the options under 1B that wouldn't be the tank? So 1B would be a new transmission route from the current water storage tank on Cox District Road down Cox District Road, which would replace the current cross country transmission main, which doesn't go down Cox, Cox District Road and upgrading the water main that's along Route 4. Um, that, that is essentially 1B um, and can be a standalone project. It is not required to be done in conjunction with the tank and the town could certainly take a long range uh, look at the projects. That's certainly an option that's available to them. Um, I, uh, DEC would be encouraging of any improvements to the system and fully understand if uh, $10 million worth of improvements was a lot to uh, do in one chunk. Uh, so long as there's improvements towards making this less deficient, um, I think they would be supportive of that. From a infrastructure standpoint, the sooner you replace infrastructure, the cheaper it's going to be. So uh, this price will obviously be different if they are uh, split apart or they are done um, in subsequent years. Um, there is a bang for your buck to do this all as one project. Those are my questions. Is this, what about the uh, water line going over the bridge? On your bridge? So the water line going over the bridge uh, on Elm Street is a separate um, item that the aqueduct is currently addressing. They, they're they hopeful of finding some, or I believe have secured some funding for that. That was not considered 
uh, in the report, frankly, because the report was being developed while that incident occurred. So it's actually standalone from this consideration. It will not address any of the um, deficiencies related to the fire hydrants themselves. Um, I know in the report that 30% of there's 30% water loss, which was a surprise. <laughs> will the um, 1A and 1B, I know you don't have a crystal ball, but will that tackle? It will. That? I wouldn't say the majority of it. If I had to guess and look into a crystal ball, I would say the majority of your water loss is in the village proper where most of the water mains are over 100 years old. Uh, that is likely where you're getting most of the water loss. Certainly haven't done any sort of study to, to pinpoint that. Um, I would also point out, unfortunately, for most of the water systems in Vermont, 30% isn't that large, actually. Um, there are definitely ones we've looked at, 50, 60, some even 100% water loss. They just don't pay for their water, so the water they lose doesn't cost them anything. Right. And then, since I have the it's okay. I noted um, your report talked about, you know, that the, the existing tank was due for inspection and we got those reports and there were um, recommendations totaling 13,400. I'm wondering if those were made. Um, I have not talked to the aqueduct about that. I'm assuming that that is um, moving forward, but I am not directly involved in that. And do you know if the well that was in the report? identified in the report was actually completed? So I believe the well has been drilled. Okay. Um, I, and I don't believe it has gone all the way through source testing. The aqueduct is using another consultant to do the source development test for that. But my understanding is, is that is proceeding, um, but will only replace one of the existing uh, sources for the aqueduct. It won't be a supplemental source. It will be to replace one of the existing uh, gravel pack wells. My question. I asked your question yeah, about the tank. Does it go? <laughs> so, if we do these repairs, is that tank going to increase the pipes Pressure. breaking in the village? So, there is a concern, and it was raised during the review of the report that increases in main size from the existing water storage tank will increase the velocity of the water running through the distribution system there is a concern that that increased in velocity will lead to more breaking of mains. Um, I would say that that's something that needs to be considered when talking with the fire department about hydrants and where on the system we are and how quickly we can open up a hydrant in one location versus another. Uh, but that is, that is a, a, a concern by increasing the velocity. Um, it will also be the case with the tank that the velocities would increase as well. So that is a long-term concern um, related to the older infrastructure and the older water mains. So it, to me, it would seem to do the Cox, <clears throat> Cox District Road pipe is something we could do relatively quickly because we'd have to secure property permits for the tank and everything else. Is that correct? It, it, correct. And if and when the town were to move forward with that and assuming that they were looking for um, revolving loan fund money from the state of Vermont, the suggestion would probably be is to treat it as one project from a design standpoint. And if those schedules uh, diverge because of negotiations with the third party or that, um, those sorts of things, they can be split um, and can be permitted uh, separately. They could also be uh, permitted together and then broken up separately after construction. Uh, the reason I would suggest doing it as one design project is actually related to how long it's taking to process financial documents, the planning loan applications. It is a loan process. It goes through a underwriting process. So you guys would be right in with everybody else in the state um, looking for planning loan money. They are absolutely inundated. Um, which used to take six, eight, maybe 10 weeks is taking three to four or five months, even longer. So with that in mind, um, there may be some advantage to doing the design as one project with two different deliverable dates, depending on how those go. And then that leaves you options available to either 
bid it and go out to construction as one project or split it into two if there was some advantage in doing so. Craig, it's been a minute since we talked about um, the lead inventory, which I know is getting published in October, but you yep. said last time we met that it's just best to assume that it's there because the pipes are my so <laughs> true. Uh, so my understanding and uh, the aqueduct is doing their inventory on, um, on their own internally. I have not talked to the aqueduct or seen their inventory. Uh, the last time I spoke to the aqueduct, their records were sparse and they anticipated a lot of unknowns, which generally, as far as the state is concerned, means it's led until you prove otherwise. Yeah. So there will, I would anticipate a subsequent phase of identification related to lead. Um, they call that the step two process in lead. And there are certain manners uh, and procedures to go through to help take that list and, and work it down. So uh, how, would I, how I would anticipate this going is that the inventory would be submitted in October. Um, it would be initially reviewed and approved by DEC. That does not mean that that couldn't be continually updated as more information comes in, but then there would be a second round of hopefully state funding to do the further identification part. And the key point with that is, um, is that the town has access to that funding where, where the aqueduct as a private company would not. Okay. Um, so that's an point, important point that well, we do consider and anticipate further money being there for step two, and that the town would have the ability to access that where the aqueduct would be limited or potentially not have any access to that at all. It's really helpful. So we would essentially just need to provide the staffing to get it done. Correct. You, and that can be done either internally. Um, it could also be hiring a consultant. It's a matter of the approach that's taken to do the identification. Yeah. And that's a system by system discussion as far as the most effective approach for a given system, not a kind of one size fits all approach. In terms of how other towns are dealing with that, I imagine we're not the only one that has like old pipes and old infrastructure, but if it's not tied to like one of these projects, are other folks replacing those just as they break or are, is is there kind of a strategic way to go about thinking about replacing? So, so the way EPA is requiring it, I believe it's a percentage and I can't I think it's 5%, but I don't quote me on that. There's a certain percentage of your unknowns or lead containing lines that need to be replaced annually to be in compliance. So essentially it's a long range plan of here's what you've got and um, you go forward with it. The, the, the other point of that is there's a bunch of money over the next three to four years to do that. And then after that, it could potentially be an unfunded mandate okay. um, by EPA. So timing of all of that and being on the front foot with that while the money is available over the next three to four years is is pretty critical so if we can front load that work it would be beneficial as opposed to waiting and then we would have to figure out how to budget that within the the maintenance costs of correct and i would anticipate that the state through the revolving loan fund will have a similar uh financing program to help municipalities with that second identification step um MSK is actually working with Bennington right now, and they're actually replacing their on contract or of their replacements. So they've actually, they got a grant from EPA a few yeah. years ago. Um, they're actually in step three of replacing what they have identified as lead containing. Um, so we're kind of, I think it's the only one in the state right now. So we're in front of the process as far as like being the guinea pigs to a certain degree on how some of this is going. Um, but it's certainly something that you don't want to hesitate on pushing the ball forward as much as you can to the extent that you can while there's money in the coffers uh, related to it. Great. Thank you. So is it safe to assume most of the pipes in the village are lead? I would not make that assumption, actually. Um, outside of Bennington, and I don't have the exact numbers, I, MSK has found very limited lead containing lines on water systems, a lot of unknowns. So those are assumed to be lead, um, but the number of lead containing lines outside of the North Bennington or the Bennington area, excuse me, um, has been very, very limited actually, surprisingly so. And, and that's one of the reasons the state forced everybody to do this first step as quickly as possible. 
they wanted to see how much of a problem they actually had. And if they can target their money that they have available to the communities that need it, that allows them the flexibility to do that because that money is specifically for lead uh, service removal. So their identification step for the second step will be uh, water quality sampling, trying to identify through sampling or digging potholes and looking at people's material uh, to try to identify how that gets done. But to raise point, that also doesn't mean that just because they're not lead, they don't need to be replaced. Like they they could be made of materials that absolutely need Correct. to be Correct. And, and so the the caveat I will say with that is the part to keep in mind is you guys will own, if, if the town took it over, you'll own to the curb stuff. You don't actually own the what they call the customer side of the line from the curb stop into the building. But EPA says you're responsible for that if it's lead containing. So there's money to replace that if it's lead containing. If it's old and you guys want to replace it, that there's not federal money available to replace that line. Now, there may be a discussion with the landowner that it's in everybody's best interest to replace that line. Less leakage for you, better material for them, but there wouldn't necessarily be funding for that purpose. So it's just a separate bucket and a separate conversation. But to your point, yeah, if you if you are digging these up and you identify that it's uh, something other than copper, uh, and you'd really like it out of there, yeah, now it's got a contractor there, you got somebody digging, no time than than now to to do it. But there wouldn't be federal funding unless it was a lead containing line. So is it just the lines they're replacing? Some of them use use lead just to pack. Correct. And, and if there were, if there's evidence of that, that is, um, that is stuff that should be removed from the system, but it's separate than the conversation. They're talking about lead containing service lines, not necessarily lead packed joints. Um, there are certain parameters where that might get included. Uh, but generally speaking, we're talking about the service connections. So if there was like just a lead packed joint, do they just replace it with something else? They got to replace the whole pipe? And everything that's a good question i'd have to defer to one of my colleagues on that because i believe the lead packed joints do not qualify as a lead containing component as nuanced as that might sound um that that wouldn't be eligible for the funds that we're talking about whether or not it's a good idea for the water system if you find them i would say yes but i don't have to pay for that too so it's easy for me to say that Um, we have some questions online, but I don't know if the select board has any more questions. Um, hold, hold on one second, gonna, but and then we'll go to so, um, everything you discussed tonight and the cost and the need for it um, can be overwhelming. Um, but whether the town owns this water system or the aqueduct continues, or it, these things still need to happen regardless of who. Yes, um, and, and I think I've hopefully been fairly consistent about that and all the times that everyone's heard me speak about this. Um, the users have to pay for these improvements. The idea is, is that hopefully the users can be put in the best situation possible, and that really means accessing low interest money, which can only be done through municipal ownership. The aqueduct as a private entity uh, cannot receive revolving loan fund money, uh, rural development money, and when things like the Elm Street Bridge happen, they can't access FEMA money uh, without jumping through a lot of hoops um, related to that, which obviously slows down the process. Um, so yes, these improvements are going to need to be done regardless of ownership. And in my opinion, the, the, the users are in the best position having the municipality in control and able to access uh, low interest uh, financing for whatever improvements. Um, I'd also note too that the purchase of the aqueduct could also be financed through the revolving loan fund money. So that is again, low interest money related to any sort of sale uh, that is an eligible expense on top of the improvements that we're talking about as well. Okay, if we're stuck with, it's fine. I, I think I'm good. Uh, Jill Davies had her hand up first. If one of them first, I have a question for Craig. Yeah. Um, a while ago, um, or, or let's say there's some interest in uh, building more in the east end of Woodstock, 
And a while ago, there was a finding that the pipe that supplies that end of town is very narrow, too narrow to do any development. Um, is, is the work that is proposed in the 1B and 2 sufficient to overcome that, or is this additional work that needs to be done, or is it even true? Um, so, in, in looking at the east end, uh, there are some hydraulic limitations, but this is typically during a fire flow event. Um, the concern right now, and I did confirm with the state, there is not a moratorium on connections for the aqueduct. That that does not exist. There has been conversations about that. The state has does not have a moratorium on the aqueduct right now. The concern is, is that adding users to the water system exacerbates the concern that the state has on the water system with water supply events. So the improvements would improve the, the water system's ability to serve the East End. Whether or not that could be further improved would be a discussion based on what type of development would be considered over there and what other improvements might need to be done. Um, any sort of water line replacement in Route 4 is going to be very expensive. Um, and it will need to be done at some point in time, but it needs to be thought out because it's going to have a big impact downtown um, related to that. So we were looking more for alternatives that solve the initial problem. Uh, they do not solve the problem of your old water mains uh, within the village core, specifically under Route 4. So, so that's really very disappointing. We're likely to spend $10 million and not actually be able to build anything in an area of the village that is developable. Is that what you're saying? No, that, that's not what I'm saying. I'm saying I don't have enough information to answer you definitively on what development in the East, in the east End uh, actually means. Uh, you could do some development right now. Um, to what degree would be, uh, you'd need more specifics on exactly what would be considered over there. So you could look at demands, you could look at fire flow uh, requirements based on those uses, uh, particular uses will have different fire flow requirements. All of those kind of get put together uh, when you're looking at something like that. The improvements will certainly add and benefit to that. I can't speak definitively to say that it would allow any sort of development conceived on the East End to be possible. Okay, uh, that, so, that would require some further discussion. Okay, so that's another study that we ought to line up. I, I certainly think it's a conversation that if there are enough people uh, who wanna talk about how that would be developed and whether or not that proposed development would be restricted by the aqueduct in its current form, uh, we could certainly have that discussion. I just don't want to make any blanket statements one way or another because there's just not specifics enough to to say that. Okay. I think I think the aqueduct is erring on the side of caution right now. And uh, between you and me uh, and everybody else, I think they are leery of making any decisions that inflame DEC uh, to push to have things done in a quicker manner than they are right now. Okay. And a second question. Um, so when we talk about replacing old pipes, if you had to guess a number that we should be putting aside for annual replacement, what might that, what order of magnitude might that be? Um, we haven't done enough uh, data collection on exactly what that would be to give anybody a ballpark price right now. It would also, um, it would also depend on what the solution is. Um, I know my colleague and I have talked about whether putting a pipe in route four to replace the other ones actually is the cheapest way to go. Um, and that really is more related to traffic control on route four. Uh, traffic control is a huge part of the construction number associated with replacing those pipes. Um, and if that can be avoided in some way, uh, there may be some cost savings related to that. So there's really some discussions that would need to be had on what that looked like. I would say in general to anybody who is looking at annual rates for anything, um, plan on being above inflation on an annual basis moving forward, that a nominal increase on an annual basis puts you in a much better position than looking at 10 to 15% increases three to four to five years at the time. 
Um, I, I won't speak for the aqueduct, but I suspect they probably um, wish they had looked at doing a rate increase um, or, or pushing harder on a rate increase so that there wasn't as much time between the last one that they had and the one that they're considering right now. It makes it a much harder conversation. If, if these mm -hmm. are annual discussions and nominal increases to cost, I think that's where water systems see the benefit of, of building funds that help them with, with future capital projects. Thank you. Um, I just want to go to David quickly. He's uh, helping us with this. I don't know if he has a point of clarification or. I just had a real quick question, Craig. Thanks for your report. Um, and this may be a very stupid question and probably has a very easy answer. How do does WAC fill the west side water storage tank? So uh, the, the water storage tank on the west side of the system floats on the system for, for lack of a better term. So um, the wells run anywhere between 18 to 19 hours a day right now. And that's to supply pressure into the village. And when the demand is not in the water system, so there aren't people drawing off that water, the water gets all the way over to the west tank and fills the west tank. So um, they pump it up the hill? What? Say that again. I'm sorry. They pump it up the hill? Yep, they pump it up the hill. So from the wells over on the east side all the way to the tank over on the west side, uh, that's how the system currently operates. One is of that the is that pump located on Barbary Hill Road? Like that white little cinder block building right there near Route 12? Or Route um, 4, sorry. So, so there are two well pump buildings associated with the sources, uh, one off of 12, and then I for, the other one is, I forget. But yes, there, there are two small utility buildings. They're, they're well pumps, essentially. Um, but those are the pumps that get the water all the way to the tank on the west side. That's correct. Uh, so there, well, um, I should be clear. I think there are two pumps, one near each of the two wells on Stuyvesant Road and Route 12. Yep. But there's also this concrete cinder block building on Barbary Hill Road on the west side of town uh, on a parcel owned by WAC. And it, that I know that the line running from the storage tank goes down Barbary Hill Road, not Cox District. So I didn't know if there was a pump in that cinder block building or what that might be used for. Uh, that's a good question. I don't know if that was an older building that was used. That's not something that I believe is currently in use. The only pumps on the water system are the well pumps uh, that get, get the water up to the tank on the west end. Uh, Todd, and then we'll go over here. Todd, you your hand up? Yeah, I just wanted to let you know that the EPA rule requires nine out of 10 homes tested must have lead levels below the action level of 15 parts per billion. I think it was a question of uh, someone had asked what was a, a qualifying uh, EPA level. That's all. Thank you. Do you mind just standing up there and saying your name so for the record? Uh, Todd Ersig, I'm sorry. Southwest. Oh. Uh, sir. I'm sorry, can you just stand there? We need to, yeah, you yeah, use my microphone. Okay, yeah. No problem. Um, my question for you is, um, what you're saying is that we have one tank that's there now, and really to get it up to adequate now, we need a second storage tank. And that is going to increase the velocity which could co potentially cause breakage in the pipe because of the velocity. Now, I know a part of that is because we also need to have, and I don't know what the terminology is, but it's for the fire um, hydrant system. Mm -hmm. Is the fire hydrant system currently its own flow system or are those each connected into the house system? So the fire suppression system is integral and connected to the potable system. So there are extensions off the potable system that are not two separate systems for those purposes. That's too bad mm. because otherwise you could possibly tamp down the velocity of the house systems and maybe leave the other, but you can't do that. And would require a lot of extra pipe uh, to separate the two systems. Yeah, they, okay. they are. They All right, are the that's what I wanted there though. Sure. Um, Ares has a question. 
Yeah, I, I just had a quick question of you, Eric and Craig. Um, is there a copy of the report that uh, has been referenced posted anywhere publicly yet, or how might I obtain one? Um, yeah, I believe it's on a website uh, under um, where we have information with the aqueduct. Uh, let me just confirm okay. it was on there originally. All right. Uh, so this is a new a new report that is being referenced this evening, now, correct? Uh, no, this report's been public since I would say last fall. Uh, oh, it okay. Approved, it was approved by DEC in January. Okay, it's or, still one sorry, of the December. same report. Then. Yep. All right. it, it's I, the same report. I appreciate that. I, w I wasn't clear if there was a, an annotated report or an uh, amended report or whatever. So thank you. Yeah, Tom, on our website, the 90% report is, uh, is on there under the uh, Aqueduct Company tab. Excellent. Thank you much. Appreciate it. Are there any final questions for Craig while we have him? In the audience. Oh, yep. Jeremy, do you want to come up to say your name at the podium and your question? Uh, Douglas Kelleher. So I have a couple of questions. Uh, you mentioned a couple minutes ago that if you didn't have to control traffic on Route 4, it'd be a lot cheaper. Does that mean you think there might be some diagonal way to get from the tank to where it needs to connect across private property, possibly? It might be cheaper? Um, no, I was actually referring to if if and when uh, pipes within the village need to be uh, replaced, that it may not actually be cheap. It may be cheaper to not put it right back in uh, on Route 4. It was, it was more related to the cost of that. The pipes, um, the water mains in the village, specifically in Route 4, are somewhere in the neighborhood of 10 feet deep uh, because of when they were installed versus what the existing road grade is now. So the depth of that and the time that it takes versus the money being spent along traffic control makes looking at other options that might seem a little out of the box uh, a little bit more possible. Okay, so you have to go down from Cox District Road to Route 4 and along to where it needs to connect. Correct, and the advantage of doing that is we leave the other transmission main in, so if there was ever an issue, it's a it's a secondary means of getting water into the water system, so we have two pipes instead of one, so we leave right. the existing transmission main, but and have a put bigger, the new one, bigger in, one or an in the road. Correct. So as far as fixing or replacing the tank, can you just make a bigger tank where it is and solve the problem, or is that more so money? To the point uh, before about where the water storage tank is on the tank, that's not ideally where a water storage tank should be. The closer it is to the sources, the better and the easier the system can operate. So one of the benefits of building a new tank is to actually put it on what I would call, quote unquote, the correct side of the system. The closer we can get it to the east side and to the wells, the wells are now pumping into the tank and not pumping into the okay. water system to meet demand. So it doesn't have to be on a hill, in other words. Uh, it does. It needs to be at a certain elevation, similar to Cox District Road hydraulically, but there are areas we've identified over on the east end and then a couple of other sites more in the the middle part of the town slash village um, where we would have the same gradient, the same elevation to do so. There are certain benefits to some sites than others, but we identified four sites where that would work. And what that allows hopefully is that the sources would just be filling the tank and then the tank would be meeting all the demand on the system and we could actually shut off the wells uh, a little bit more often. If we built a bigger tank, that's certainly an option. Um, we were looking to build something of a similar size to be a straight replacement for the existing tank that does not preclude anybody from proposing a larger tank to either increase future capacity or to um, improve fire flow conditions even, even more so uh, throughout the system. And then the intent would be is that eventually when the West tank needs to be decommissioned, it can just be pulled off the system. Uh, doesn't have to necessarily be reconstructed or replaced. Right. Um, and then the new tank feed out to the West End and meet distribution pressures um, out there. So essentially, the new tank serves a couple of different purposes. It allows for easier, hopefully cheaper operation, but also is a, is a way of replacing the other tank sooner. And you get the benefit of both tanks for as long as that other tank is, is useful. But we don't have a spot to put a new tank. Uh, we've identified four spots. They're all privately owned spots. Um, the ideal spot is actually uh, Mount, uh, Mount Tom. And working with uh, the, the federal government to put it in the park. Um, 
which isn't as bad as it sounds, but that's ideally the best spot because there's a 12 inch main that runs right by the park and would allow us to hook the tank in and outside of a handful of users, we would set up the situation where the wells are feeding the tank and the tank is feeding the rest of the system. Thanks. Yep. So, yeah, see so no other questions. So, as always, thank you for your time. We appreciate all your information. Anytime. Thank you. Thank you. Next is, I would like to consider a motion to enter an executive session under one BSA 313. That's potential contracts that are after making specific findings that premature general public knowledge will clearly place the public body of person involved at a substantial disadvantage. Need a motion. Uh, moved. Okay. Second. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Yeah, so we'll be going to that conference. Do you need me to bring this? Yes, please. Okay.